Hello, hi, welcome to this online message coming to you from Free School Court Evangelical Church Bridgend in South Wales, which if you are listening from another country and don't know where South Wales is, it's part of the United Kingdom. If this is the first time you've watched one of these videos coming from the church, then a special welcome to you. If you're a, well, uh, a regular, then welcome back. Now, getting enough food to live on is a major difficulty for some people in some parts of the world. And then, of course, in other parts of the world, there's the opposite problem. People eat too much, and there is the whole issue of obesity. The situation is intensified somewhat by the lockdown in many countries at the present time on account of the COVID-19 coronavirus. On the one hand, there are concerns in the UK that some people will seek to deal with uh, the difficulties of being isolated, being in home on their own, by turning to comfort eating. And that could then produce all kinds of health problems. On the other hand, uh, there are also concerns which some people have that they're going to run out of money. And are they going to be able to feed themselves and to feed their families? And that is a very real concern in some parts of the world. I saw a post on social media last week from one African country where the person really lamenting how, how little is the food which they have to eat said that even if they were in lockdown for 10 years there would be no danger of them putting on weight. And that brings me to the Bible verse on which I want to speak in this message. It's a verse that's found in what is known as the Lord's Prayer, the Lord being a reference to Jesus, and not so much to a prayer which he himself prayed, but a prayer which he taught his disciples to pray. I say he taught them to pray it, not in parrot fashion, but he taught them that this was a kind of outline of the things which they should pray about. It's found in Matthew's Gospel, that's one of the accounts of the uh, life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and in the sixth chapter. And we've come to verse 11, which is where Jesus says that we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. If you've heard the previous message, you will know that I was wanting to stress there the pattern or the order or the structure of this prayer. That the first three requests are not directly about us. Indirectly they are, but they're not directly about us. They're all about God, about God's name, hallowed be your name, about God's kingdom, your kingdom come, about God's will, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The next three requests are directly about us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But in the previous message, I was at pains to stress that Jesus began with God. This was characteristic of all his teaching, and the Lord's Prayer both expresses that reality and reinforces it. That if we pray along the pattern of the Lord's Prayer, it will express and help to reinforce the importance of a God-centred approach to life, because Jesus begins with God. But now I want to look at uh, another truth, which is equally important, and it's this, that having begun with God, Jesus then goes on, to say that we must consider our needs directly. We must bring them to God in prayer. In other words, although he begins with God, he doesn't end there. He then goes on to deal with our needs. And I have three things I want to say about this request. And really, again, I'm looking more at the order, the structure of this prayer at present. And God willing, we'll look at the actual details of the request on a future occasion. Uh, but here's the first of the three things which I want to say, and it's this, God is concerned about our needs. 
Just before Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer, he said to his disciples that they weren't to pray under the mistaken idea that by praying they were informing God of things, so that if they didn't pray, God wouldn't know about them. No, no, Jesus made it abundantly clear that God knows what our needs are before we pray. And just a little bit later, after this, uh, giving his disciples this prayer, Jesus then addresses the whole question of the concerns of his disciples not only about what they will eat but about what they will wear and he instructs them that they're not to be anxious about this they're not to be burdened or worried about it and he says your heavenly father knows that you need such things so God knows the needs of his children and teaching of Jesus and the teaching of the Bible is abundantly clear that in speaking of God's children he's speaking of those who've come to place confidence personal trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord their master their teacher their Savior the, these are they who are God's children these are they who Jesus says on another occasion uh, have been born again they've undergone a spiritual rebirth but that does not mean that God is only concerned about them. Because a little bit earlier, not very long before Jesus taught his disciples this prayer, he made it abundantly clear to them that God has a concern for all people. He said that he causes his rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous, his sun to rise on the good and evil. Of course, rain and sun are essential for the growing of crops. And the growing of crops is essential for providing food. What Jesus is saying is that God is concerned about all the people whom he's made. I wonder if you've got the right view of God. Perhaps you're not a disciple of Jesus and you've got this view of God that he's someone who's against people uh, because that's his nature to be against people. There can be all kinds of reasons why people have that mistaken view of God but it's really a very distorted view because the view of God which Jesus presents and the view of God which the Bible presents is that he's passionately concerned for the welfare of the people whom he has made oh yes it's true that the Bible speaks of God's justice of his judgments of his anger not anger in the sense in which sadly it's often displayed by us as human beings as a display of loss of temper where we lose control no God never loses control he never loses his temper his anger is his settled reaction to evil but he's not against us in that sense yes he is against people for their evil but that's not because he's uh, how shall I put it it's not because I can say this without being irreverent because he's a grumpy person who's always against people no no that isn't the God of the Bible at all he's kind he's good he's generous and his anger is really an expression of that when he comes again uh, up against evil in human beings so God is concerned for the needs of the people whom he's made and God has revealed himself supremely in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the God-man. He's God and man in one person. So that he said one day that whoever has seen him has seen the Father. And it's abundantly clear that Jesus Christ was very concerned about the physical needs of people. So he went about healing people. He spent a lot of his time healing very sick people. On one occasion he fed 5,000 people. They'd been listening to him teach and it was getting late in the day. They were in an isolated place and he didn't want them to send them away because he was concerned that some of them would almost be fainting with hunger. So he provided in a miraculous way. He provided, he took some bread and fish, just a little bread and fish which was handed to him and he, he prayed God's blessing on it and performed this wonderful miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now that miracle is important for many many reasons but one of the things that it demonstrates was Jesus' concern 
for the physical needs of those people and on another occasion he fed 4,000. Not just food, not just physical uh, healing from sickness. On one occasion he said to his disciples, come apart with me and rest a while. He knew that they had become rather overburdened. He knew that they had become rather uh, overtired. And that being so, you see, he was concerned for their physical well-being and welfare. So, do you have the right view of Jesus Christ? Again, some people have all the wrong idea about him, as if he's against people, how kind he was when he was upon earth, how generous, how caring. So that's the first thing which I want to bring before you from this fourth request of the Lord's Prayer, God's concern for our needs. That leads on inevitably to the second point, which is this. Because God is concerned for our needs, therefore we should be concerned for our needs. We should be concerned for our needs. Now, this is where some people go seriously astray in their understanding of the Christian message. It's a misunderstanding of the Christian message. People who are not disciples of Jesus you may be one of them, they're afraid to commit themselves to him. And they're afraid to commit themselves to him because they're aware they have certain needs. They have need to provide food, they have need to provide clothing, they have need to provide housing for themselves and if they have a family, for their family. And they've got it into their head that uh, because Jesus Christ makes radical demands upon us, well, if, if they follow him, what's going to happen to their earthly needs? But, as I've just been saying, God is concerned about those needs. Jesus Christ is concerned about those needs. We should be concerned about those needs. And coming to trust in him does not mean, therefore, that in some way uh, we're going to abdicate responsibility for our lives. I've come across people who've had this, and it's been a very real fear, and it's been a very real hurdle keeping them from committing themselves to Jesus Christ. Sadly, they may have learned that from some real disciples of Jesus who've misunderstood the teaching of Jesus. They've got it in their heads, you see, that uh, they must never have any concern for their self. That, that any concern for self must inevitably be wrong. Now, there's a very great Christian man who lived in uh, America the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, his name was Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. And on one occasion he made this very, very important statement. He said, Jesus Christ did not come into the world to unself us, but to unselfish us. Ah, there's the world of difference. How often have Christian people misunderstood this? They, they, they pray that God would empty them of themselves. Lord, let me empty myself of myself. But that's all wrong. God has made us. God has given you yourself. Jesus Christ didn't come so that somehow our self could be obliterated. He came to unselfish us. And that's an entirely different thing. In other words, the Bible doesn't hold, Jesus Christ didn't hold, to a, a teaching, a false teaching that's known as asceticism. That's a teaching which wants to play down our physical bodily needs. Now, it's something which the Bible has to warn people against. So in his letter to the Colossians, that is a group of Christians uh, who'd, who'd formed, been formed into a church in the ancient city of Colossae, Paul, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ, warns them of this very teaching. He's aware that there are going to be people, they were travelling around the ancient world, and they were seeking to distort the Christian message. And they had a very negative view of the physical realm. And their idea was that the, the more spiritual you were, the, the closer you come to God, the, the less you become interested in the physical realm. No, no, that's all wrong. Again, 
Quite some years later, Paul writes to a younger colleague of, he, of his, a man called Timothy. He's left him in the ancient city of Ephesus. He's aware that the same problem could, could arise there. Ephesus wasn't a huge distance from Colossae. And, and he warns that there are men who are going to forbid people to eat certain food and forbid people to marry. Now, sadly, that kind of idea isn't confined to uh, distortions of the Christian message which were current during New Testament times. That's still the case today. Sometimes even amongst people who are known as evangelicals, that is, people who take the Bible seriously. And yet I've come across some who've had this view that to be a single person is more spiritual and you'll be a better disciple of Jesus Christ if you remain unmarried than if you marry. Whereas the Bible gives an honoured position to both. A single person can be a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. The married person equally can be a devoted person to Jesus Christ, though in different ways that discipleship is going to express itself. And then perhaps more subtly, and I've come across this in recent years, and it's been a particular problem for some young people, particularly some university students. There is this teaching where, well, yes, marriage is all right as long as it's all about advancing the kingdom of God. See, this is the point. God is first, and so everything has to be about advancing the kingdom of God. So marriage is all right as long as it's helping you in the service of God. Well, clearly, uh, the Bible doesn't encourage a marriage that is going to hinder a person in the service of God. But the problem with this approach to which I'm now referring is just this, that it, it fails to take account of our human, this worldly needs. It's always got to invest a sort of spiritual significance to everything. Now, I'm not denying, I'm not denying for one moment that God uses uh, and blesses a marriage just as he can use and bless a single person. What I'm concerned to deal with rather is this idea that a person can't just enjoy being married, enjoy the company of their spouse. It's always going to be, now how is this advancing the kingdom of God? Now that's the kind of ascetic strain which the New Testament condemns categorically and unequivocally. So it's right for us to be concerned about our needs our physical needs. Do you bring them to God? See, I've come across some Christians who've said something like this. Oh, I could never pray about this need. It, it, it's too small. It's too insignificant. Really? Did not Jesus say that God takes note of a sparrow that falls to the ground? Did he not say that we are worth much more than sparrows? Is he not concerned about the little things? Didn't Jesus Christ sometimes, uh, even when he was about the most important aspects of the work of the kingdom of God, give attention to little things? Didn't he give attention to physical things? When he was dying on the cross, doing the greatest work that, that could ever be done, dying for the sins of the world, he sees his mother and he knows she needs to be cared for. And he sees one of his disciples, the beloved disciple, who was almost certainly the apostle John. And he says, uh, mother behold your son, son behold your mother. And we are told that from that moment on, this beloved disciple took Jesus' mother into his home so that she had a proper home, someone to care for her. He was concerned about her, this worldly needs. Are you troubled? Are you concerned? Where are you going to get money from to feed your family, to feed yourself? Are you concerned? Are you going to pay the rent or the mortgage? Uh, as a result of the economic hardship that may uh, ensue from the lockdown, well, bring it to God. Yes, don't begin with that. Don't become so worked up about it that that's the first thing you pray about. But I say this in, in the very name of God. Don't, don't having prayed about the, the kingdom of God and the will of God and the name of God, say amen and leave it there. But go on and bring your physical needs. In the words of an old hymn, come, make your wants. That's an old use of the word want. It means needs. Come, make your wants and burdens known. Bring them to the Lord and pray about them. So then, the first thing is, 
God is concerned about our needs. The second thing is, therefore, we should be concerned about our needs. God the Father is concerned about that. God the Son is concerned about that. The Bible says that those who are disciples of Jesus, their bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have to be concerned about our bodies. But now thirdly, if firstly God is concerned about our needs and secondly we are to be concerned about them, thirdly we are to be concerned about the needs of others as well. This prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray is a very interesting prayer because, as I said right at the beginning of this series, he's setting it in the context of someone praying in the quiet of their own room. Go into the room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret, says Jesus. So there you are, you're on your own, and you're praying to your Father in secret, and this is how you should pray. Excuse me. But notice that all of these requests are in the first person plural. That is, it's not give me my daily bread, it's give us our daily bread. So we're to be concerned for ourselves because Jesus Christ did not come to unself us, but we're not to be concerned only about ourselves because Jesus Christ did come to unselfish us. So you are concerned about your food, your clothing, your housing? Well, do you not think that your Christian brothers and sisters have the same concerns? Are you not aware of the needs of Christians, not only perhaps in your own church, or Christians in your own locality, but of Christians in other parts of the world? Are you only praying? about your own needs. I'll never forget speaking to a man who'd been a Christian for many, many years. And I felt that he had quite a misunderstanding of one aspect of uh, Christian teaching. And so I wanted to try to bring this home to him by pointing out to him that he prayed for other people. So I just assumed that he did. I said, well, you pray for other people? And he said, well, I pray for my family, my wife and my children. That was it. I, I nearly collapsed with amazement that a man who had been a Christian for many years, nearly 20 years at least at that point, never prayed for anyone other than his immediate family. Well no then, Christians are to pray for their spiritual family as well as their natural family. Give us this day our daily bread. But not only for fellow Christians. As I said, not long before giving the Lord's Prayer, Jesus pointed out that his heavenly Father causes his Son to rise upon all people. He causes his rain to fall. That is to say, he, he doesn't say, well, I'll cause the rain to fall on those who are disciples of Jesus Christ, but not on anyone else. I'll cause the sun to fall upon the field of a farmer who's a real Christian, but not upon someone who's a an atheist or a pagan? No, God isn't like that. He provides. He provides rain, he provides sun, he provides crops, he provides food for all sorts of people. So although the immediate focus of this request in the Lord's Prayer is for fellow Christians, because it's our Father, those who've been born again into God's family, there's a broader application of it than that. We to remember those who are needy who are not Christians as well and of course that means that if our praying isn't to be hypocritical we have to do something about it it's no good a man lying in bed all day and praying oh God give, give, give us this day our daily bread and then he never gets up and he never works he never does anything he never goes to the shop to buy the food if he's got the money no no we're then going to do something and so that equally applies if we are praying for our brothers and sisters, if we've got the means to help someone who really doesn't have the means, then of course we've got to do what we can. We can't feed all the world. That, that's impossible. But we've got to do what we can. We've got to look to the needs of fellow Christians. We've got to look to the needs of fellow Christians in this country, in other countries, but not only fellow Christians. We've got to look to the needs of all people, even as Jesus Christ did. You know, on one occasion he healed ten people of leprosy. 
Only one came back. Only one came back to thank him. Only one realised who this Jesus was. But he then didn't say, he didn't say, well, as it were, I'll unheal the other nine because they haven't come to thank me. No, no, no. He was kind. He was good. And if that's what Jesus Christ is like, that's what his disciples are to be like. Can you see that as you begin to look at the structure of the Lord's Prayer, how wonderful it is? Can you see how it sorts out so many issues? Can you see how full-orbed it is? And so, this is a great prayer. We begin with God, but we don't end with God. We then go on to bring our own needs before God in prayer. Well, I'm going to pray now before I bid you goodbye. O oh Lord, thank you for the wonderful prayer which Jesus taught. Thank you for his wonderful example in the way that he lived, in the way that he taught. We thank you that he gave everything. Lord, we had to give things, but he gave everything. He died for our sins. He rose again. And he is the great Saviour. Hear us, O oh Lord. Bless your truth to us, we ask you. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's been great having you joining. I really look forward that you'll, to the fact that you'll join with us again in a week's time when we're going to continue with the Lord's Prayer. Until then, God bless you. Trust that you'll have a blessed week and God's blessing not only on you but upon all your loved ones. Goodbye.